Excuse me. Welcome. On behalf of the Pi Kappa Alpha Foundation and Pike University, I'm pleased to introduce our marquee leadership lecturer for the 2013 Academy. Pike University is dedicated to providing top-notch leadership lecturers and personal development training for you, the students. We go to great lengths for each Pike University event to bring in some of Pi Kappa Alpha's most elite alumni in the fields of education, business, public service, and athletics to serve on the Pike, U, Pike University faculty. Gentlemen, tonight is no exception. David Greenberg is president of Greenberg Capital. He has more than 22 years experience in private investments, commodities trading, and global markets. Mr. Greenberg has been the president of Sterling Commodities Corporation since 1996. He was a member of the New York Mercantile Exchange Board of Directors for three terms, has served on the executive committee from 2006 through 2007, and has been on the executive board of directors for CFBTA since 2000. In addition to being a regular guest on financial networks, David has taught at the Museum of American Finance and has presented his lecture series at conferences and universities throughout the nation. David Greenberg is a leading expert on the transition from open outcry to electronic trading and the effects it's had on the markets. David also consults on the topics of commodities trading, business risk management, and leadership training. David's goal is to clarify sophisticated and complex issues confronting today's markets. Greenberg Capital Consulting and Lecture Series. David Greenberg, a 1982 initiate of our Alpha Chi chapter at Syracuse University, is a popular face and voice of CNN, Fox Business News, and many things Wall Street. He is a guest lecturer for the finance program at West Point, the Whitman School of Management at Syracuse University, and Hofstra University. Brother Greenberg is, a highly, sought after, is highly sought after for his advice and counsel in areas such as commodities trading, executive, bo excuse me, executive board decision making, and business projections. He attributes his success to the skills obtained when he was an undergraduate member of Pi Kappa Alpha, and his ability to leverage those skills and his fraternity connections throughout his career and personal life. This evening, we have the luxury of learning what the Pike connection means to David Greenberg and how we can achieve leadership so that it can be turned into a lifetime of success. Please join with me in welcoming leadership lecturer and our brother, David Greenberg. I was your age, somebody came up here and spoke to me. I must look really old, right? So I wanted to explain something what I have that you don't have right now. I remember what it was like being where you are. I remember what it was like being 17 or 18. And as much as I thought I knew everything, and I did, because I was a Pike brother and I was at Syracuse and things were good, I've come to realize that some of the older people in my life gave me great direction. And I know that a lot of times in my life, I've been through keynote speaking events, that halfway through the keynote speaking event, I'm looking at my, I'm looking at my watch, I'm clapping at the appropriate times because somebody's clapping next to me, and then when the keynote is over, I lean over and I tap the guy forward in front of me and I go, God, thank God that's over. Tonight's not gonna be one of those nights. If you will allow me to bring you in to what I have done for the last 30 years. I'm telling you there are going to be points in your life where you're gonna have an aha moment. And I don't want you to remember that it was David Greenberg that told you whatever. I want you just to think back of a weekend that you spent in Memphis. A weekend where you learned from me and some of the other speakers that are coming tonight and just think back to saying, I get it. If you can do that, then my job coming down here from New York, being in this 120% humidity climate, will, will be done, and I will be very, very happy. 
but I want you to know that tonight I'm not coming to you as what people call a leader or a success. I'm coming to you as a Syracuse University arts and science graduate who had dyslexia as a kid and other learning problems. I'm coming here to tell you that everybody can be a leader. Everybody can be successful. And a leader and success has nothing and will never have anything to do with how much money you make, what car you drive, and what kind of clothes you wear. The true leaders that I've seen in my life, period, are those that people look up to in times of trouble, in times of stress, and in times of happiness. And if you can look back at your life, even though I'm only 49, and you'll see some of the things that I've done and accomplished and enjoyed, and if you can look back and your kids can look at you and be, wow, you're going to talk to how many people at your, at your fraternity's convention? Well, to me, that makes it all worth it. So what I'm asking you to do tonight is I really want you guys to stay focused with me. I'm not going to teach this as or talk like a keynote speaker where they get up behind the post and they look down and they just read it. That would drive me crazy. I'm going to treat you as if I treat my West Point cadets when I speak to them, my Syracuse graduates, when I talk on CNBC or Fox. We're going to be equals tonight. Okay, but what I, this is what I need from you, okay? I want you to realize that being Pike is unique and special. I would not have come down here if I didn't think so. And there's so much that you can learn. But we're gonna stay focused tonight, and this is gonna be an interactive conversation. And tomorrow's money management class is gonna be the same way. But what I need from you is that I need a little help. So whenever I go like this and point to you, as corny as this might sound, I want to hear you yell, Pike. Will you go with me on that? Because then I know if you're paying attention, because you don't know when I'm going to go like this. OK? So one, two, three. Pike! OK, my kindergartens did a little bit better than that. West Point guys did a lot better than that. OK, one, two, three. Pike! There you go. OK, so you never know when it's going to come. So if I were you, I would definitely, definitely pay attention. So now I'm going to ask you to take the journey with me back in time. We're going to go so far back that, yes, I was thin, OK? And that's like way back there, OK? We're going to go through my time as a pike. We're going to go through my time as a floor and what led me up to here today. Thank God for mirrors. There's a little shameless advertising. Do it whenever you can. <laughs> this picture that you see here is during the Greek Games in 1982. The Pike Foundation was very important to me. I remember when I was Russian. It's a very, very important time. But something stood out in Pike. Well, maybe the fact that they were the black leather jackets, jean jacket, toughest fraternity on campus at the time. I know I didn't fit in, but we went with it. Okay? But they had a sense of being and honesty and loyalty that I could see more than any other fraternity. And I remember when the president of the fraternity came over to me and grabbed me by the collar and said, kid, what's your biggest concern about Russian? I said, I'm worried about hazing. And he's like, hazing? We don't haze. I go, what do you mean you don't haze? He says, why would we treat somebody like crap that we're going to call our brother? I mean, don't get me wrong. I, got, I did their laundry. I did all, you know, got them sandwiches. But there was never a point where I felt threatened. And there was never a point where I felt worried. And it really brought the bonds of brotherhood much quicker than my other friends who were at other fraternities that was too busy, you know, eating fetal pig. Well, they got kicked off campus, okay, and a few other things. Okay, so it was very, very important to me about the strength, you know, of the fraternity itself. Now, of course, we had the Pike formers, formals. And why Pike is one of the reasons why I just said was the brotherhood and the bonds and everything else that went along with it. Now, if you notice this picture here, this is a good leadership picture. Let's see if this thing works. See that area there and that area there? Well, the pizza led me. I didn't lead the pizza. OK, so that's 40 pounds ago. Do not let this happen to you, OK? It's just very simple, very straightforward. 
okay? I can make it a lot worse, I can take my shirt off, you guys would not be happy. I tell my kids about my six pack, they didn't believe it, I found the picture, my, my son's like, who's that? I'm like, it's me. I had to like swear on, on the Bible to say it was me. So you see that? You see this? That? Th don't go there, okay? <laughs> That, that is very, very important you know, in your leadership skills. Just so you know, during our formals, yes, we had uh, stair surfing. I think that was our big thing back then. Okay, that's Brother JT on the bottom. That was the president. Uh, the, he's a good role model, you know, if I do say so myself. But the fraternities at Syracuse, they had a great greet system, and we had some great parties. Remember, it was always, you know, the Pike Way was not who you came with, it was who you left with. So it was a very, very interesting time, you know, back then. <laughs> so then here I was, I was a young Pike. I wanted to do something like really cool. I wanted to do something that was different. So we're headed into the Greek games. We're all getting ready. We're getting our war paint on. All of a sudden, somebody looks out the window. One of the brothers looks out the window and they go, holy crap! And the whole fraternity runs out and says, what? What's going on? And I just had a smile on my face because I was the only guy that knew what was going on. Well, I had three horses delivered to the front of Pike, <laughs> okay? Now back then, it was called a phone book, the yellow pages. It's not like you just Googled horses at Syracuse. So things were a little bit different back then. Okay, so I had three horses. We came on to the, nobody has ever made an entrance like this to the Greek games again. It was truly the best. You had to see the brothers. I was in like Flint after this, okay? I might have been the skinny one there, but I was, and I wasn't a big drinker, but again, anything I'm talking about tonight, I want you to remember, the drinking age was 18 back then. So life was a little bit different, okay? So the two things that we were very happy about at Pike was one, the drinking age was 18, and two, there was no such thing called Facebook, okay? Because that could have been a bad thing in itself, and we'll talk about that later too. So we go on to the Greek games, we just, we have a great time. Now the guy to the left, okay, that was my big brother, right there. Steve Lord, the Lordy man. He came from not Rochester, New York, he came from Rochester, New York. He turned me on to ACDC, turned me on to a band called Duke Jupiter, the Lordy bar, he had this greatest bar in his room. But he was a guy of integrity. He was a guy that sat me down, he was my first mentor. He was a guy that looked at me and said, David, you know, and it was so cool in his little way because he had this big, thick mustache. Don't listen to anybody. You could do whatever you want to do. I don't think he quite meant that I could do whatever I wanted to in a good way, but I took it that way. And it's, it's amazing. When you have a big brother or you are a big brother, do not underestimate the power that you have with some freshman that's walking into the room for the first time and looking up to you. We sometimes forget you're very young. You don't realize that even as a sophomore, junior, or senior, you can change somebody's life. You can bring your values, your good values, to them. And that is extremely, extremely important. And you should always, always remember that. So now we're gonna move ahead a little bit further. This is my first day of work, two weeks out of Syracuse. I was very happy because the guy that I was working for turned out to be in the mafia. And when I got there, one of his friends was found in a ditch. They told me to come back two weeks later. So I had two weeks to kill in Chicago. I had nothing to do. So I, I was like lost. But here is me two weeks later. I'm ready to walk onto the trading floor at the first time. Again, notice, notice the chin. I don't see it somewhere. Notice the chin and stomach. Not there yet. Okay, so the pizza hadn't beaten me. And the sour cream and onion potato chips. And the donuts. We can keep going on. But this was a very interesting day in my life. This is where I learned, and it's very, very important to understand. Mentors come in all shapes, sizes, ages. They can be women, they can be men, they can be older, they can be younger. The key thing is, is to always keep your eyes and ears open to know when a mentor is being there to mentor you. They might not even know they're doing it. I met a guy there my first day. I went to Chicago. My father was one of the largest silver traders in the world, and he was in New York. So I wanted to go to Chicago just to do the, you know, my own thing. And luckily, and unluckily, the first day that I'm in Chicago, this guy, he's about 5'2", 5'3", scraggly red hair, a beard like Santa Claus, but red, kind of hunched over, grabs my neck and says, I know who you are. Well, what do you mean you know who I am? And he goes, you're going to be in the pit one day. 
You know, I never got in the pit. It's been 30 years. I'm never going to get in the pit. Someone had told him, you know, who my father was at the time and that I would have the opportunity, hopefully, to go into the trading pit. And he goes, kid, come here and sit down. And he goes, shut up. And I don't know what's going on. He goes, I'm going to give you some advice. It was the most amazing advice. He goes, I don't want you walking out of here any day without picking up something new, without learning something, without seeing something. He goes, I don't care if it's the way that a runner runs when he's got a certain order ticket into the pit, what, the, what his face looks, what his speed is. I don't care if you look at somebody and saw that they were out all night drinking and what they look like hung over the next day. I don't care if it's who's sleeping with who or who's talking to who. I want you to notice something, the way the clock moves, the way the colors of the jackets change. Don't walk out of here without learning something every day. And every intern I've had, I've given the same speech to. What I actually do with my interns when the trading floor is open, I'd sit them on the trading floor for two weeks, or sometimes three, in one spot. And I would get calls from their parents, and I would get complaints from them, oh, I'm not learning anything. And I, I would look at them, I'm going to show you a picture of the trading floor in a second. I'm going to say, you're going to tell me that you learn nothing? You're in the most amazing place in the world. Talk to me again in a week. I want you to look at the world this way, not this way. You know, it's, you know they, they have, used to have a saying, get your head out of your, you know what? Well, now it's get your head out of your phone. You know, I've said to people, and people just sitting there like this all day, you know, like this. Get your head out of your phone. Look around you. Look, listen, learn. It's very important. If you are the type of person that takes everything that is offered to you and everything that you can see this weekend, notice how many people showed in, up in the room tonight. Notice who's paying attention, who's not paying attention, because I might go like, Thank you. You never know when that's going to happen, right? But you got to stay on your toes. Being a trader, the best thing that we did was we learned to live in the moment. I mean, I used to say this and it was impressive at the time, but you know, long term for me was 45 seconds, short term for me was like two seconds. Well now long term in computer words is a nanosecond, so you know, I'm just, you know, I'm just old fashioned. But you got to make sure that you're always in the position to take in everything. Be a sponge, and at, at any age, you got to just make sure you're going to take in everything. If you walk out of this weekend and only learn one thing, it is a failure. I've learned 20 things since I've walked through the door this morning. I mean, just for example, Ryan's driving me here, and he tells me about this uh, theater arts building that they have, and I'm all of a sudden like, wait a minute, I'm doing a deal with somebody in Rochester, New York. Maybe I could put these people together with a theater arts company, and look what we have. You don't know when one conversation from one person could change your life going forward. So always pay attention. Now we go to my next fraternity. It was the New York Mercantile Exchange. Probably one of the wealthiest fraternities you'll ever see. We called it high school with money. If you knew what we talked about down there, you know, when the cameras were on us, you'd think, oh, we're talking about, well, you know, Saudi's doing this. And, the Gulf of Oman, BS, we're talking about what's going on with the baseball games and what's going on, who's dating who. It's not what everybody thought, but we had a good time. We put on a good show. But that was the pit. That's now empty now. So what you see on CNBC, they never pulled back to show you the entire pit. But the New York Mercantile Exchange was a place where everybody had its back. They had everybody had their back. If one person got hurt, they were, everybody was there. If somebody's child got hurt, we raised money. You know, but at the same time, we were all competitors. But the key that what being on the New York Mercantile Exchange taught me, which was the best, was that you were never allowed to lie. You know, you got to remember, I was trading crude oil. I was going to buy them, sold, sold, buy them a whole bit, right? Writing it down on my pad, throwing pick cards in. And there wasn't one lawyer. There wasn't one person there, you know, you know watching over everything. It was just one-on-one. -on -one. And there was this one guy that did 15 lot of trade. The market went down. He lost 15 grand. It turned out he was having some financial problems. He looked at the guy and goes, I didn't do the trade. The other guy's clerk came over, rips the pad out of his hand, sees that he crossed it out, right? The guy never came back to the floor. His career was over. So what it really showed you was integrity is everything. You know, NYMEX politics was a contact sport, and I was in it very deep. But even with all the... The, the politics and the moving around and everything else, everybody was still honest and straightforward. Now let's talk about life as a trader. Do we have any, did have two guys from Syracuse show up today? Where are the Syracuse guys? I got your name down here somewhere, but 
Stand up and come up here for a second. If you can't embarrass your own fraternity brothers, what can you do? So we're going to show you what it was like being a trader. Okay? How are you? Matt. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Rob. Rob, nice to meet you. Matt, stay over there. Rob, stay over there. You know, get in front of these two screens. Okay? Now, what we're going to do is I want to teach you guys what it was like being on the floor. There was no greater rush than being a trader on the floor. Okay? We weren't the stock market. Anybody's here, parents here, stockbrokers? I apologize. So, <laughs> stockbrokers are great. We love the stockbrokers. However, the stockbrokers were the guys at the Nick Games that were still in their jackets and their tie tied up to here at 11 o'clock at night. The commodity brokers were the guys in the ripped jeans and t-shirts that were probably having beer since 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Much different crowd. Stock in the stock market, if you ever see it on TV, they would walk up to you and they'd tap you on the shoulder and they would go, oh, excuse me, you know, I would like to buy a thousand shares of IBM. Nothing wrong with that. In commodities, we were all in the circle, as you saw in the pit, and we would scream our brains out, wave our hands, try to get noticed because it was recognition trade. Just because if I go sold you know, over here and you go buy them, right, and let's say he wanted me to take out his sister and I didn't, I could look at, he could look at me and go, okay, or I could look at him and say, you got nothing, and then you got 20, you got 20, you got 20, you got 20, go home. Okay, so it was a much different thing. It was a very, very rough game. This guy over here, Stevie Baggs, the one to the leaning over there, he's one of the toughest guys, Staten Island guys. The commodity market was all Staten Island and Bronx and Brooklyn, where you know, the, the, the um, stock exchange was all like you know, Harvard and Yale and Princeton. So I always wanted to see a fight between the commodities market and the stock market. That would have been a lot of fun. So what I want you guys to do, okay, I want everybody, we're just gonna do a little interactive thing, because I wanna see what it was like. I want everybody to stand up, okay? You're gonna control this side, you're gonna control this side. Now when we were trading, I mean, forget this, okay? Whenever I wore a suit, people thought I was on some kind of interview, because most of the time, unless there was a senator down there or we were filming something, we were in, we were in uh, not even jeans, we were in chinos, we were in uh, sneakers and either golf shirts or once in a while we got a t-shirt. We made a lot of money in golf shirts. It's amazing what you can do. But, so this, you know, this to me is just, I feel like I'm in a monkey suit. So when we wanted to buy things, which way do you think our hands were? This way, right? Because buying, I want them, right? If we wanted to sell things, which way do we go? Sell. So I want, on the count of three, I want, and you know what the weirdest thing was? Was hearing your own voice the first few times, because this is very embarrassing, but you guys proved you could do that already. So I want you guys to control this side, you control that side. And when I say one, two, three, I want you to scream out, buy them. Okay? One, two, three. Buy them! Right, that was okay. Ready? One, two, three. Buy them! Okay, no, I don't see anybody's hands going. You gotta get the hands going, too. Okay? This is interactive learning here, okay? One, two, three. Okay, good. Now I want you to say sold. One, two, three. Sold. sold. It's funny. Everybody says sold much better than buy them. I don't know why we all did the same thing. We always go like sold, and it was like, oh, people used to love it. You just got out of such a rush. You know, it was good. It's like just get out of here. So now, anybody that has a birthday from June, May, I'm sorry, January to June, I want to say buy them, and from July to December is going to say sold. Okay. One, two, three. Fire! Okay, now what I want you to do, okay, is you're gonna keep doing that till I say stop. Okay? Ready? One, two, three. Fire! Now put your hand on your chest. You know what it was like going to the Super Bowl every day for work? <laughs> And you'll wonder why I have mood issues now. <laughs> okay, you guys can sit back down. But I have to tell you, it was great. Now, thank you very much. Okay, long live Syracuse. Go Qs. We can only get rid of Beheim because he's great until the last two minutes of the game, even now. Okay? Now, that was my friend Tack. One of the reasons why I have some. Now, this guy over here, you got Tack, and this guy got Swan, who's like this. The guy was amazing. Okay, because it could be 110 degrees on the floor. This guy like walked out, his shirt was pressed every day. He was just perfect. I, I, but I can draw a map of the back of his head because I looked at the back of his head for 20 years. Okay, that was me on Monday. Notice how intense I was. Notice how I was ready. I was there. It was a, 
I was so happy to get out of the house. You know, I came in, I was ready to go. And then by Friday, I was a true pike. <laughs> okay? And we were just ready to start the weekend. And then on Monday, it just started over again. And then by Thursday, usually, it hits the next time. Okay? Okay, we're going to switch gears a little bit now. We're going to talk about social networking. There is no excuse for people of your age not to be an expert with social media, period. It is the most important thing that you will ever do going forward. How many of you have LinkedIn accounts so far? OK, very good. Okay, I want anybody with a LinkedIn account, I'll put in a special thing like Pi Kappa Alpha, so you know, because they sometimes say, do you know this person? It really ticks me off, and then you got to get their email address. I'm like, if I knew them, I wouldn't be going through this thing. So do me a favor. I want everybody that has it to add me to your LinkedIn. Everyone who doesn't have LinkedIn should have a LinkedIn by tomorrow or the next day, and then add me. You all need to start working on your network now. Okay? Networking is going to be a key in your life, period. Okay? How many people here have Twitter? OK, great. There's a shameless plug there, too. OK, I want to see everybody follow me on Twitter. Okay, you can ask me questions. This is not a one-time shot at talking to me. OK, I am devoted to the fraternity. I am devoted to help you out. So you can either get to me on LinkedIn, you can get to me on Twitter. And what you should really do, third shameless plug, Go to my website, put your email in, and I'll send you the free newsletter and everything else that we do. Okay, and that's greenbergcapital.com, which I'll show you at the end. But stay connected. Guys, you know, you guys are great on Facebook. Okay? But guess what Facebook's gonna do to you? Facebook is gonna turn around and bite you in the butt. Okay? It's great the fact that they've just finally hit their IPO level or close to it again. But you guys put things on Facebook, and my kids put things on Facebook, that you think is safe. I'm telling you, it's not safe. Facebook owes you nothing. You don't own your pictures. They don't go away. By the way, everything you ask Siri stays in the Apple data bank for two and a half to three years. It, that's, it just doesn't go to your phone. So you know, you got to stop asking, what are you wearing? <laughs> okay. I only know this because I have to stop asking, what are you wearing? <laughs> OK? You know, or the, a lot of other things we ask it. <laughs> so you have to be careful. And I'm talking to you not only as my brother as I would, as I would talk to my own children. You put stuff on Facebook. I have a Mac upstairs. It's a cheap Mac. And if you go to iPhoto and you put in, if I put in Ryan's face and I have a 1,000 pictures in my iPhoto, it will pull out every photo of Ryan. Well, guess what? When you go for job interviews, and everybody goes for job interviews, right? they ask you for your background. When I was younger, they did what they called a Fidelifax report on you. They looked at it to see if you had any bankruptcies, if you, what kind of you know, debt you had. Well, guess what? You're going to tell me that Facebook isn't going to you know, be happy to charge XYZ company for information on you? If I'm running a big corporation right now and you're coming to me, okay, and don't think that that old bit that my kids did and everybody else did, that you change your name. My son was called the dictator. I said, listen, dictator. I go, they're going to know who you are because of facial, facial recognition. So be careful what you post. I cannot tell you enough. You know, you got this guy Wiener in New York, right? The guy could have possibly been president one day. He was actually pretty bright. I know a lot of people that know him. He's not a bad guy. He's stupid, and he might be a little sick, because the whole point about this new scandal that's happened is not the fact that he did it, but he did it after he said he wasn't going to do it anymore. Which, if you're going to do it after you say you're not going to do it anymore and run for mayor, you got some serious you know, compulsive issues. So here it was that a simple tweet, I mean, listen, he tweeted his picture of his underwear. Okay? There's worse things that are happening with the sexting and all this other stuff that's going on with the, with the kids and everything else. Trust me, I don't. You know, what would you want to see this for? Okay, but okay, but what you want to be very careful. And I'm pleading with you on this. You gotta taper it down. This this feeling that you guys have to show the world everything you do. Okay, the bottom line is, if you're underage drinking, I don't think there's an employer 
that will go to hire you, that will not expect the fact that you will have had a drink. Okay, if you came to me and said, I never had a drink, I would know that you were lying. But I would be concerned if you guys weren't smart enough not to post it. That is a bad judgment call. And when employers go to hire you, they look at your judgment skills, because judgment skills is a direct result of where you will be going later on in life. And it starts early. Let me tell you something. I didn't just stop eating Twinkies, right? It wasn't like, okay, I've been eating Twinkies my whole life. I'm gonna stop. It's like you have bad judgment and when you're younger, it follows you through. So I'm asking you, as a brother and as someone who's a father, you gotta cool it. You gotta bring it back. You know, it, in our day, it was like, oh, did you hear this? And we talk about it. We didn't actually show pictures. And I know I'm belaboring on this point, but please, you're going to regret it in about five or 10 years when this stuff gets out. Facebook, Instagram, all these things, Snapchat, chat. You think that that thing goes away in three seconds. Yeah, sure, it goes away into their database. They have it. It just doesn't disappear. Nothing ever disappears in the digital world. It is always there. You wipe out your computer, you throw it in the garbage, guess what? I guarantee you there are people in this room that could figure out a way to take that knowledge and everything that the data that you have on the computer and pull it out. Gold is not the most valuable commodity anymore. Oil is not the most valuable commodity anymore. Data is the most valuable commodity anymore. And for you to be giving this data out for free is crazy. And sorry if I get a little crazed about it, but I get, it really ticks me off. Okay? You're, you're asking for issues. If you use your social media right and your networking right, you can get connected with people. Okay, I do a lot of CNBC, I do a lot of Fox. It is fun, I'm not gonna lie to you, it's a great rush. Live TV is the best rush in the world besides trading, which I can't do anymore because there's no more trading floor. Okay, but when you don't know what question they're gonna ask and you're on live television and you know that you could screw up and about hundreds of thousands of people, and not only that, it's on video now, so millions of people will see you screw up, it is great. So you know how I do this? I do my homework, I pray that they don't ask me something, that's not you know, on the agenda, but I will tell you one thing, and this is what you should also do in an interview. I have been interviewed, and they have said, what do you think about bonds? And I'll never forget, I looked at them and I took a breath and I said, it would not be responsible for me to answer this question for your viewers, because I am not an expert in bonds. They go, thank you very much, Mr. Greenberg. And we ended the interview. I got a call from the producer and he's like, that was great. Nobody's ever said they don't know on live television before. That was really impressive, we'd like to have you back. And I go, why do you want me to have me back? I just said I didn't know. He said, I'd rather have you say that you didn't know than BS your way through it because everybody can tell when you're BSing. And then that goes for you guys with interviews too. If you're in an interview and somebody asks you a question that is out of your wheelhouse of knowledge, just be honest with them and say, excuse me, sir or ma'am, I'm really not sure about that question, but I will do my best to look it up for you and get back to you. That they will respect and they will respect it well. Now we go back to networking. It's kind of interesting. I'm in the green room. The guy next to me to the left is um, a Syracuse. Uh, he's, I think he's gonna be a junior, he's my intern. Liz to the right, she always used to love when she was on the trading floor that I would actually turn the interview around and start asking her questions. So I made it memorable so she remembered me after all those years. The interesting thing is a guy walks in, and this is again about getting your head out of your phone. This guy walks into the green room starts talking to me about oil, but all this other stuff, we realized that, hey, he went to Syracuse, he graduated in 1987. He was, I think he was with one of the other fraternities, but he wasn't with ours, so I didn't really care. Okay, so we got started talking for a half an hour. I walk into the, into the studio, and it turns out he's the co-host. Instead of just sitting there on my phone chatting with somebody, I made the connection. And I have to tell you, when you guys go on airplanes, and when you travel, Get your head out of your phone, get your head out of your iPad and talk to the person next to you. I met some of those amazing people by sitting down on the plane and talking to them. The art of discussion is being lost. Get it back. You will be surprised on who you're gonna meet in life, but you're gonna be even more surprised on who you're gonna miss if you don't engage the conversation. Have faith in what you talk about and faith what you say. Know that you're bright, you're bright enough to be here today, so you, guys have got to make sure that you connect with people. It is extremely, extremely important. And then once you get a certain amount of knowledge, you really have to start thinking about giving back. Now as you heard, I teach at West Point. 
and Syracuse. I stopped kind of going to Syracuse a few years ago because my daughter was in Newhouse and I wanted to kind of make it her campus. I didn't want to keep showing up. But I teach a couple of courses, the transition of open outcry trading to electronic trading and what it's done to the markets. Let's talk about honor. Okay, does Pikes have honor? Yeah. Well, I was the only board member in the world that voted against electronic trading. When I told my chairman, who actually got me onto the board, that I was going to vote against it, he said, if you vote against electronic trading, you're off the board. I said, well, it's going to hurt the market. You're going to have too many market swings, and it's going to be manipulation. He goes, yeah, but it's going to be good for the IPO, and it's going to be good for the trading floor. And we had a whole argument about it. I voted against it. I stood up. It was the only vote in NYMEX history that was taken backwards. We said, who's against it? I said, me. It's been very nice seven years. I'll see you guys later. But I kept my integrity, and guess what? If you look at the markets now, I think that it turned out that I was right. We talk about moving past mistakes. What are you guys going to do more than anything in the world? And this is a whole course that I teach, or a whole class. What are you guys going to do more than anything when you guys graduate? Anybody? Come on, show of hands. What are you going to do? Make money? Work? Yes! Have you been to one of my lectures? Oh, that was good. You see, that's very good. Yes, he got it right. You are going to screw up more than you ever knew possible. And I teach a class on screwing up. And I have to be honest with you, it's one of my best classes. Because I'll give you one little snippet and, why, and, and how we think. I was one of 15 or 17 traders brought down to the Marines down in Quantico. They want to know how we thought, how we thought so quickly, how we could make such big decisions with that money on the line. Because what you need to understand is I didn't trade other people's money. I only traded my own money, or I only traded my own money. So when I have a bad day, it's not like I got a commission. If I have a bad day, you want to go home, kick the dog, throw it out the window, do something crazy. Okay? And what's interesting is also you find is when you have a good day, it's not as fun as having a bad day as bad. Okay, so we learned that in trading, 70% of our trades are bad trades. So we had to learn very quickly not to sit on our butt and go, oh my God, I screwed up, this is terrible, what am I going to do? You learn to react. You learn to trust your reactions. The one example that I, one of many examples that I give in this lecture is that imagine being in your kitchen and there's a bottle of Snapple on the counter. The Snapple falls, you look at the, the Snapple, it goes all on the counter, down the side of the counter, onto the, onto the floor. You go, you know something, I've got to clean this thing up. You pick up the thing, you go, you get a mop, you clean it all up, it's all clean, right? Or there's the kid or adult that the minute it, it falls, grabs it, picks it up, grabs a towel, or puts his arm down right here, and the spill never hits the floor. Which person do you want to be? Which person do you want to think like? Right? The second one, you want to be able to react. We talk about reaction and reaction speed. It would be great if I could see this. <laughs> reaction and reaction speed. But most important thing that you have to understand when you go out there, you're going to screw up. It's OK. It's how you handle the screw ups that are important. Do not sit on your butt and cry about your screw ups. That is bad. Understanding that you will have them and immediately going out and fixing them, which we'll talk about at some other date. Um, will be good. Those, my newsletters, have, we talk about that stuff. I also teach about navigating and understanding the complexities of the workforce. Let's just take one example to give you a quick freebie right now. Okay, when you walk into a meeting, go to the meeting five minutes early. You know what people don't do anymore? They don't look at nonverbals. I made more money than you could ever imagine by people's nonverbals. I knew that there was a guy in the gold ring that whatever he had a big sell order, he'd turn his back, Take a deep breath in because you had to breathe to say sold. And all of a sudden, it would be 90 bid. I go, sold at 90, sold at 80, sold at 70. I go, 50 bid. And he goes, sold. Because I could tell by his nonverbals. I could tell by the guy behind me that when he was offering 500 contracts and he was taking my shoulder and pushing it down to the ground and I was trying to hold him up, that he really had the order. And I was not going to stand in front of him. And if he offered 500, I kept my mouth shut. But guess what if he offered 500 and he didn't touch me? I looked at him, I go, buy him. He goes, oh, five. And then he would show the whole ring that he knew not, he didn't have it. So if you take the time to read people, again, get your head out of your phones. Read people, look at people. When I have a meeting, okay, I would always get to the boardroom 10 minutes early. 
For you guys, 10 minutes early might be too early, so go five minutes early, only because they might wonder what you're doing in there. But watch the people walk into the room. Watch how they interact. Are there enemies that are talking to each other? Are there friends that aren't talking to each other? You'll get the feel of the meeting. It's very important. Look at people's nonverbals. You will know when it's time to talk to your boss about a raise, in, you know, whether it's talk, time to talk for a vacation, whether you want to move your desk. You will know when your wife or girlfriend is having a bad day if you are connected to the people that you're with and you talk to them and you look at them in the eye. You will get ahead in business because your boss will say, hey, this kid knows something. This kid's got it. This kid's on the ball. It's not that you're that much smarter than everybody else. You're paying attention. Most people aren't paying attention, and that is the problem. Money management, we will talk about tomorrow. Trading tips, we'll, you know, if you sign up for my newsletter, I will be more than happy to send it all to you. Okay? Becoming a leader. This is where you guys are right now. There's a few general rules. There's a lot more, but I'm going to make a few tonight. Be a team player. Obviously, we all know that. How many people here are in sports? Or played sports even in high school? You know, we all did something. Don't underestimate being a team player. Realize there are no shortcuts. If you find a shortcut, I will guarantee you it is wrong. Or I will guarantee you that somebody will find out about it, and they will not be impressed that you found a shortcut. There's a difference between a shortcut and doing things correctly and efficiently. Leave your ego at the door. You're all life. OK, let's try it again. You're all life which is really cool and really good. But when you go to work, especially for your first job, you just got to tone it down just a little bit, OK? There is a difference between, well, that's the wrong thing, between confident, cocky and confident. It's not about your schedule. Very important. I'm going to give you an example. The other, about two weeks ago, I, did a, I got this deal that I'm doing with this guy, Anthony Scaramucci. And He's from uh, Skybridge Capital, SALT Conference, one of the biggest conferences in the world. And he offered me, because I was uh, teaching his interns, I was doing a few classes, a half an hour of his time to go over three deals that I was thinking about doing. And I'm like, I can't believe that this guy is taking the time out to talk to me. I'm like, when? Now I'm 49 years old, I've done pretty good in life, I've done okay. Here's this guy, I mean, he runs $7.9 billion in his hedge fund. He's like, 10 o'clock, my office. I'm like, I'm there. I go to his office at 10 o'clock. He's not there. Turns out he had a doctor's appointment that, he didn't ha that I thought he didn't have, but it turned out he did. And he messed up, and he calls me up. He goes, when can you meet? I go, when can you meet? He goes, 4.30 this afternoon at my office. I, I just didn't, I didn't hesitate. I'm there. Meanwhile, I had to cancel everything that I had that afternoon. I had to figure out how to spend six and a half hours in the city of time that I hadn't had planned. But it wasn't like I said to him, you know, it's really not a good time since you didn't show up this morning. How's next week? Because you don't know if there's going to be a next week. So if you meet somebody and they say, are you available? You do everything you possibly can to make it work, period. Of people like this don't often give you second chances. So you got to take it and run. Listen, if I'm doing it at 49, you guys can do it. Listen, well, look, you see there's dyslexia for you, I told you. Look, listen, and learn. Remember what I talked about with that guy with the scraggly hair, right? He, every day, every day, just find something. I don't care what it is, it can be the smallest little thing, but you know what that does? It keeps your brain attuned to focusing and looking at everything. Time life moments, very important. We all have them. A time life moment is a moment where any direction in your life history can change, for the better or for the worse. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. But the most important thing is that when you have one, and I'll explain what, like, what one of mine was, you need to grasp it and make sure you do it. Let me tell you about a great time life moment. My father was out of work. He was broke at 38 years old. He had graduated college three years early because he was mathematically genius. He was a mathematical genius, and he was out of work. He was at somebody's country club, and he was at the urinal, hanging out. They're not looking at each other. The guy says to Marty, where have you been? He's like, well, I've been out of work. I'm looking for work. And he goes, well, how about you come over and check out the commodities exchange? So my father goes, what's the commodities exchange? Oh, you can trade silver, Marty. 
well, it's silver. How much can you make trading silver? Now, this is 1978. He goes, well, you can make $200. You can make $200 a day. So he's like, great. He goes down there, ends up being the biggest silver trader, one of the biggest silver traders in the world. Again, time life shift. You got to be confident, not cocky. You have to be able to admit when you're wrong. Being, over right, being right all the time is overrated. Nobody is right all the time. If you are wrong, it's OK. Accept it and move on. Don't stick to something just because you need to prove to somebody that you're right. Be able to look back and say, am I right? Or is this working? Stay light on your feet, which is just really be able to change. And expect failure. Who here hasn't failed? Good. There are no excuses. Let's talk about excuses. I had an accident a year ago. I had an infection in my eye. I was, I was out, I had my hard contacts on, I put some water on my eye, I got a massive infection in my eye. I end up scratching my cornea. Well, when the cornea heals, it heals cloudy. I get a cornea transplant about a year ago. Everything was great. Four days after the cornea transplant, walk into my closet, take a t-shirt, T-shirt, rip it off the hanger, the hanger breaks, whips around into my eye, rips out my, my cornea, my optic lens, and my pupil. They rushed me to the hospital, they found my cornea underneath my lid, they found my lens somewhere at home, and they were able to put back the pupil, but it doesn't close, and that's why these lights are killing me. Okay, but I meet Ryan, and he says, how would you like to speak at the Pike Convention? No excuses. This is an opportunity of a lifetime. This is an opportunity for me to share what I've learned. I could have very, very easily said to Ryan, to CNBC, to Fox, I fake it on TV all the time. I'm basically blind out of my right eye. I can see shapes and, and blurred, but I fake it pretty good right now. But again, no excuses, ever. You just get it, and you get it done. Now what we talk about becoming a leader, once you are a leader. Understand risk-reward and correlation risk. You can even do that now. Risk reward, putting pictures on Facebook just to show your friends how wasted you got the other night and you ran down the street butt naked. Great, your friends see it, what's the risk? I, if I see that, you're not being hired. Not worth it. So really start looking at risk reward in life. Be straightforward, simple, because we are? Boys. Yeah, there you're getting there. Okay, be straightforward, no BS. Always stay connected, even as a boss. When my staff used to have to come in when there were exchange problems and the back office staff came in, and I didn't have, I, I was the front guy, I didn't know anything about the back office. I brought them breakfast, I sat there, I read newspapers, they said, what are you doing here? I said, if you're here, I'm here. I wasn't out playing golf, I wasn't out hanging out with my friends. If my office staff was there, I was in. I don't care if it was two o'clock in the morning or Saturday or Sunday, I always stayed connected. Realize that in chaos there's opportunity. Any good businessman will take a chaos situation and find something good out of it. Try to do that. Football games are controlled chaos. The good quarterbacks can find opportunity within that chaos. It is very, very important. Knights of the Round Table, get some. They're always good to have. You can do that now. You don't ever have to do anything alone. I have my knights in my round table, and they often change once in a while because someone will let you down someone that you thought you could trust, you found out that you couldn't, it happens. But get a group of confidants that you can talk things out. Your own opinion all the time is not a good thing because most of the time you will not look at each, yourself in the mirror and go, well, I'm wrong. Have people at your round table that are strong enough to be able to say to you, you're wrong, you're out of your mind. What the hell are you thinking? If you have people that agree with you all the time in your life, you will find you will make many, many mistakes. Respect goes both, goes both ways, as I said, with my, with my employees. When they were there, I was there. Temptation, it's never worth it. There will be times in life where you get tempted. And you'll take the easy way out and try to make some money. Don't do it. I have a zero compliance record trading after 25 years because I never wanted to have to look at my kids and say, well, I was on the front of the Wall Street Journal because I was taken in because I was cheating. I was able to go on CNBC and call out the F CFTC and the SEC for what they weren't doing on the exchanges without any fear of retribution 
goes, the guys at CNBC, I was like, you sure you want to say this? I'm like, sure, no problem. Now let's talk about leadership under pressure. I remember this great morning. It was gorgeous outside. I drive to work, park my car underneath the building, go to the elevator because I always have uh, breakfast upstairs. And the, the express elevator wasn't working. This was when I was starting to get larger. And I got lazy. I was like, I don't want to deal with the local elevator. So I go upstairs. I go sit in my office. I start talking to somebody. First plane hits. I had eight people that I didn't meet for breakfast, 12 people that worked for my company that were up in a meeting that day. And I found out a lot about leadership on September 11th. It was very interesting. First of all, when we started, when the second plane hit, we started evacuating the building. So as you can see where it says NYMEX, we were about three blocks away, or one and a half blocks away. And I was right, I don't know if I can get this, I was right there when the building fell. But I made sure that I was the last person out of my office. So okay, I had my little leadership role there. But then what happened was we got a call from Washington, D.C. saying world oil markets were going crazy. You guys got to get up, and you got to get up as soon as possible. So the chairman, this guy Vinny Viola, who was a colonel at, uh, at a Colonel Army Ranger in his past, brought the Nets back to Brooklyn, one of the most successful traders in the world. Kid from Brooklyn started out with nothing. He called an emergency board meeting. It was time to make sure that he led. I didn't have to take my ego, talk about check your ego at the door. It wasn't about my ego trying to bump up against his. This guy knew what he was doing. He was more efficient than I was. He understood. And I sat back and I said, this is a time for me to learn from the best. And he ran the, the rebuilding of NYMEX in a week as a military operation. What you guys are too young to remember is that everything from Canal Street was closed for three months, except people didn't know when NYMEX was open. Okay, the stock market was no big deal because the buildings fell away from them, but the buildings fell on top of us. So we had to get cell towers in it. We had to rewire stuff, and they had all these board members doing it. And we were taken down on the ocean, you know, on the river by marine escorts. We had sharpshooters on, on, on the roof and, and bomb-sniffing dogs in the building. It was, and we had the morgue outside. It was three feet away from the building. But Vinny taught me how to really lead under pressure. And he kept it cool, and he kept it good, and he took everybody and put them in really where they should be. So when you become a leader, don't worry about stepping back and allowing someone with better skill set for that situation to take over. Don't step back and step out. Step back and open your eyes and learn. Because I don't care who you are, there will always be somebody that's a bigger leader, more money, better looking. There's always somebody. If you, unless you're Bill Gates, there's always going to be somebody richer than you, so get over it. Okay? So you just got to deal with that. Sorry. Now, there are no ifs. If this isn't going to work, if this is not going to work, it gifts piss me off. Okay? Go for it. That was my button, if you saw in the first couple slides. Okay? Ifs can really drive you crazy. Now, I was going to read you this poem if, but if I do, you're going to fall asleep. But I want everybody to do, do me a favor. I want you all to download this poem. This poem was given to me by my father when I was 13. It changed my life. I gave it to my son. I had it up on the wall at work. And it is a key point. And I'm just going to read the last paragraph. If you can talk with cra uh, crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings nor lose the common touch, if neither foe nor loving friend can hurt you, and all men count with you but not too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything in it, and which is more, you'll be a man, my son. This poem changed my life. I kept it on my wall. In times of trouble, I went back to the poem. When you download the poem, read it thoroughly, read it through, and you will see what it can do for your life. It is a great roadmap to leadership. Now we're going to talk about where Pike is headed and where you guys are going to love this. Ready? Because we are... Pikes! Oh, come on, let's go. We've got to wake up. One, two, three. Pikes! Good. Exponential networking. I'm not sure if it was really a word, but I threw it in there and I looked it up and it was. Okay, so imagine me being the, the guy in front. All of a sudden, 
I'm out. I hear this guy that I was talking about, Anthony Scaramucci from Skybridge Chapel, starts talking about a restaurant, that he's opening up a restaurant in Manhattan. I only spoke to Anthony a couple times. I'm doing a deal with a named chef that I can't name right now. He's on TV, okay, in another part of the country. And here it is that you got to look and think about that Anthony is here. The chef is there in my network all the way at the end. And all of a sudden, my first thought is, put them together. Okay, you know what the biggest mistake in networking is for most people? Most people only network within their own community. And that, you know, and that's a problem. Because let me explain to you how it normally works in networking. So here you have banking. Some people think that I was maybe a big shot or not a big shot in commodities. Okay, so, okay, big deal. So now you have government. You notice the two don't really go together. There are people, there are senators came in. I gotta be honest with you, I was never impressed. I, you know, I had breakfast with Hillary. I met all the, the presidents. Never did anything for me. You know, just because Hillary walks in and says, oh, I'm Hillary Clinton, I'm like, okay, that's nice. We had no voting Hillary buttons on anyway. But, you know, it doesn't cross over. And then you have, I'm gonna have to walk down, I apologize. Okay, then you have healthcare, you have big shots in healthcare. Media, communications, but if you notice, you know, everybody knows a big shot in some area, right? Does everybody know somebody that's big in some area? They used to come onto the floor, I don't care, and guess what? You know, when I did a movie with a friend of mine, Michael Imperioli, you know, I walked on the set, I was like, hey, I'm on the board of the New York Mercantile Exchange. They're like, what? They didn't care. And that's hard, and that's hard when it comes to you guys. Okay, so here, then you got another, you know, you got the media, you got real estate. So here it is, you have all these different major networks that are hard to break in if you are a big shot or even if you're connected in any way, shape, or form. Now, how many people, how many presidents of the United States do we think that we have in this room? Well, I'm sure there's one or two. Okay, we'll take one, two. Rock stars and super athletes, right? If you were a rock star, super athlete, or president of the United States, guess what? You can do this, you can cross. Well, let me tell you about an interesting lunch I had a couple of months ago. It was, have, has anybody here looked up prominent pikes on the website? It's like, whoa. Okay, so we have this lunch with Kevin Turner from CEO of Microsoft, the head legal counsel of Starbucks, you got this good uh, Bud, who is a sports athlete, you know, sports um, agent. We had this meeting, and it was a great meeting. And we all talked about what can we do for Pike? Where should Pike go? Now it's time that Pike goes to the next level. And this helps out everybody in this room and will help out generations to come. And that's simply to make Pike the networking capital of any fraternity in the world. Because now that you're a pike, and forever a pike, you can actually now be connected. Because guess what? I'm here. You got people that from, you got people talking in the next four or five, you know, three or four days of different communities. And you all now have connections with them. And what we're gonna need from you and from the alumni is to make sure that we make Pike into a networking machine. Because in today's day and age, networking is more important than anything. Okay? It is tougher and tougher. We all know how hard it is to get jobs out there, right? You know, the, the, you know, the, the brain drain is tough. You know, there's just, you know, companies that are doing very well aren't hiring like they should. It's a problem. But with Pike, and Pike going forward, and the alumni of Pike stepping forward, helping out, working a network. Brian, you're gonna have a blast with this. <laughs> so, you know, he's like, what? You know, he's, he, we talked about this. He's gonna do great, okay? You, and it's gonna work out great. Does everybody understand how the networking is the most important thing that you guys are gonna focus on? You guys are gonna all connect with each other. You guys just put in Pi Kappa Alpha on LinkedIn. And anybody that has Pi Kappa Alpha in their database will link up. Link with all of them. Start your network now. I guarantee you that the people on this side of the room don't know the people on this side and don't know the people in the middle. You come from all over the place. 
Use this time to network. There are CEOs in this room right now. There are great lawyers to be in this room right now. There are media moguls in this room right now. You guys are all going to get there, and what you guys are going to realize is very simple, is that Pike, as a fraternity and as an entity, is growing to the next stage, and it is going to be more important for you guys to help out and stay connected. I'm not going to lie to you. The last time I wore something from Pike was, I can't believe I found this, 1986 on the back of my, my gown when I graduated. I had the t-shirt company in Syracuse. By the way, Fagans and Bugsies, they still use my, my t-shirts. I thought it was a great deal. I sold him the rights to the company for $1,000 at dinner. He says, why do I want to do this? I said, because I made $1,500 on every order from you. So I had dinner with my parents, and $1,000 later, I gave them the rights to the company. But we had Pike 1986. So just to, you know, just to sum it up here, you know, we've traveled through time from when I was an 18-year-old brother to a 49-year-old Pike alumni. The future lies within all of us, you guys and the alumni, to make sure that this is not just a fraternity. Pike is an ever-changing entity that has the potential to enhance every one of your lives. We're going to need your help. From the smallest house. Pike. Oh, come on, let's do that again. From the smallest house. Pike. From the newest and oldest brother. Pike. From headquarters. Pike. That was a lefty, you like that, right? From all the alumni. Pike. We can make this the strongest, most successful networking fraternity in the country. Pike. Who are we? Pike. And who will always stay on top? Pikes! So remember, leadership comes from a passion within. You guys all have that passion. You all have the passion to be here this weekend. We will meet again in 20 years. And if you don't have that passion, I will come back with my cane and hit you on the back of your heads and say, what have you learned from the past 20 years? And when we meet here 20 years from now, I want you to look at me and say, I got it. I had some of those aha moments. This weekend, not just with me, you have a tremendous amount of speakers. You have a great group. Brian and his staff has put together a program that anybody would be proud of. So take it all in. Whoever thought about stealing the duck, don't do it. Okay? I was online, I'm hearing this about, well, you know, we're going to get a bucket for the duck. You take the back seat. Guys, don't steal the duck. Okay? No ducks. All the ducks stay. You see, you all, th you all thought about it. You know? Okay? There aren't enough ducks for everybody, so no ducks. Take Ryan, tie him up, put him in the car, but not the duck. Because Ryan wants to make sure that you guys can actually come back here the next time that they have this. And, you know, because this is a great place to have it. So just in closing, you have a great opportunity here. I look at you, and I'm going to be honest with you, I am jealous. You're young. You're thin. You're smart. You have passion, and you have hope. And I am telling you, if you stay with us, and you go forward with and you network with us. all of you will have the chance to come back to this convention, speak here, and I guarantee you I will make the trip down to listen to you. I make that promise. So I want to thank you very much. If you have any questions, I think we have time, you know, if you have any questions, but from my heart and from my soul, I am proud to be a Pike brother. And this is one heck of a fraternity that you guys have going. And you should all be proud to be Pikes! Thank you very much.
That's a great rush. Thank you very much for allowing me to be back in the ring with you guys. Does anybody have any questions? There's always one that gets you going, okay, about being a trader, about Wall Street, about what's going on in the world. Anybody? Or anything that I said tonight? It's got to be somebody that has the first one. Yes. Uh, you talk a lot about your business experience, networking, and stuff like that. And you talk a lot about your successes. How do you balance that with your personal, social, family life? That's very. That's a great question. I was very lucky. You know, I'm a big shot talking about you know business and, and all, you know talking about it. But my market closed. Well, originally we closed at 3:10 when you know the exchange closed. And then after September 11th, the chairman says, well, we're going to put a temporary closing at 2.30 so the girls don't have to walk through ground zero at night. So I stood up and said, well, why don't we not put the word temporary in the press release? Because London is very happy that we're closing at 2.30 because that way they can get home a little bit earlier. So for the last 10 years of my career, we were done at 2.30. Now, unless I had a board meeting, which was a couple times a month, it made it very easy for me. I was at every one of my son's games, my daughter's projects. So it's very easy for me to say that I was able to balance it out because I was very lucky to have the position that I had because traders, we were just done. You know, when you're a lawyer or you're you know, an accountant or all these other things and you're working till late hours, the most important thing I can tell you is never put a dollar in head of, ahead of your family. It is not worth it. You guys are children to your parents. And I'm sure all your parents did the best that they can do, and nobody's perfect, and we all have things that we have to do. But I am telling you, when you do have kids, not for a while, got it? There's nothing better. And you will not understand what a parent feels like when you're on that field. My son's lacrosse, and my, my daughter's a photographer, and she's a Newhouse student, you know, and, and she does film and editing. And I always say to her, I love watching the world through your eyes. My son, who was actually going to D1 schools until he blew out his ACL, and now he's going to Haverford down in Pennsylvania to play lacrosse for them. I loved watching him play. So when it comes to that balance, do whatever it takes to make sure you have that balance. Because if you work the extra 10 hours, or you spend the 10 hours with your kids, and it's easy to say this for my position, I'll be honest with you, but try to, try to spend it with your family. Because the bottom line is you can be as rich as you want. I know a lot of very wealthy people that are very lonely. And that's not worth it at all. Any other questions? Yes. What are your thoughts on uh, Goldman Sachs and what are doing? Uh, hi, Gary. Um, yeah, Goldman Sachs is interesting. Gary Cohn, who's the co-president of Goldman Sachs, cleared through our company you know, at first. Um, and what's really interesting is Gary Cohn is probably the only co-president of a major company. He's a graduate from... Uh, American University, which was a good university, but you know it's not Harvard, Yale, but yet he's making 40 million a year. So he did something, you know, he did something right. I think with what Goldman is doing and what J.P. Morgan is doing, and it's interesting that you should ask me that because I'm in the middle of I'm an expert witness for some of this stuff. Um, there's it doesn't bother me as much as aluminum as it does in the energies, because Morgan Stanley and a few other companies have storage facilities in Westchester to store their oil. And I'm like, well, they're not using it to run their building, so they're only using it to take oil off the market for when they're long. And as a trader that enjoyed it when there was more of a supply and demand market before you had all these mega companies in it, uh, it's really not, it, it, listen, they're not doing anything illegal. It really isn't illegal. If you want to own it and you own it and you can buy it and store it, well, you can do it. Okay, you know, there's a lot of controversy on whether or not it's legal or not, or whether or not it's manipulation. But if you have a, a billion dollars and want to buy aluminum, put it in your garage at home, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, so it's a tough call. I'd rather if they didn't do it, because I think the markets would be more pure. And the fact that J.P. Morgan just announced that they're going to be stepping out of that end of it, you know, they're going to be getting rid of their warehouses, I think it's much better for the, for the market itself. Questions? Yes. So financial industry is so broad. What made you believe what the body part of the inspiration? My father was an inspiration. I went down to the floor, and if you guys Google NYMEX, and I'm not going to admit that I said it, there's a Robert, Down, Robert Downey Jr. thing when he went down there. It's just funny to listen to him at the end. But when you went to the trading floor, when it was the real trading floor, it was the most intoxicating thing you will ever have done. I mean, I remember the only other thing that I can liken it to is I, I threw the first pitch out to the Met Yankee series once. 
that was a great rush. And uh, you know, so when you have a rush like being on the trading floor, it's very hard to say that you didn't want to do this. Also, going to work in your t-shirt and making that kind of money, you're like, oh, I like that. You know, I mean, it was, a, it was a crazy way of life. We were like the rock stars of Wall Street back then. Um, so there wasn't a lot not to like about it. But the success rate once you were in the pit was very low. You know, very few people, it's not that it had what it takes to do it, because that's not a fair statement. Just some people didn't handle the amount of money that can go in and out of your hands, and especially when you're trading your own money. You're down 5,000 one minute, you're up 10,000, you're down 17,000. You know, there was an article that was done by one of the schools that said you have to be a psychopath you know, to be a trader on the, on the commodities floor, because we're all nuts. You know, I've got 10 more minutes till I can hold it together before I start hitting my head against the wall. You know, so, uh, but it was a fun place to work. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, what would you say is your biggest weakness, and how has it affected you, you progress your life? Okay, and I know I've been kidding around about this, but my weight is my biggest weakness. My weight issue and eating through an emotional, you know, with my eye and not working out and everything else, but that kind of a weakness is a weakness. And I, don't, and I know I kid around about it with you guys, but it's something that has to be controlled from a very early, you know, early age. But besides that, I think my biggest weakness was a little bit of my dyslexia and my ADD. There were times in, that I had to learn to deal with it, right? There were times in this lecture, you might have saw me go off a little bit on a tangent and then pull myself back in. There were times that I would leave the boardroom, I would go into the bathroom, slap myself across the face, say, okay, you gotta go back in there and focus, right? And then come back in. I knew if we had a six, six hour board meeting, I was walking out at least four times Everybody thought I had irritable bowel. I didn't have irritable bowel. I had to go smack myself in the face. But the thing that you do is you learn. That's a great question, though. But you learn. Everybody here has, has issues, OK? Except for my ex-wife, nobody is perfect. Trust me, <laughs> uh, OK? You know, it's amazing. The day, that I, the day we finally broke up, I looked at her. I said, listen, I spoke to the mathematicians. It's theoretically impossible for me to be wrong every time. And she's like, no, it's not, OK? <laughs> So we all have weaknesses. The key thing to do with your weaknesses is work around them. You know, and that's very important. Don't just say, I, I, I suck at this, and let it go. Don't do that. So what are my weaknesses? A lot of weaknesses. But I'm very happy to be able to stand up and be in front of, I don't know, hundreds of people and say, I have a lot of weaknesses. And pizza, yes. <laughs> Both. I know it's a standard answer, but both. You know, you'll find that the better you get on your weaknesses will naturally build up your, your regular skills. Because a lot of your regular skills you're naturally good at. You know, it just happens. You know, you might be naturally good in math or naturally good at negotiation or naturally good at not falling under pressure. Okay? But yes, try to accept and embrace your weaknesses. When I started out by this, you know, this lecture by saying to you that I'm not coming here as this guy that you see on the screen. I'm coming in with you as someone that's got to figure this stuff out every morning when I wake up. And it's not easy. And there are days that I fail, and I fail miserably. But it's by working on those weaknesses and, and accepting that you have them, not accepting them and saying, oh, I'll just, I'm bad at that, so I won't do it. It's, that's not accepting. Accepting them and saying, I am bad at that. I am going to do everything in my power to figure out a way to go forward on that. Okay, I never wrote a piece for the board. Thank God for spell check now. Okay, I'm, I'm old enough to know that there was no spell check. So that helped, that was a weakness. I mean, you know what, and you know what's another one of my weaknesses is that my vowels are so bad that sometimes spell check doesn't work. So thank God for dragon naturally speaking, because you can talk into it. And one of the reasons why I can get up here and talk for an hour, he could have gone for another hour, is because I'm a terrible, well, I've become a better writer if you read my blogs, but I was never a good writer when I was younger, so I did everything verbally. And that's how I worked on my weakness, and that's why I could walk into a board meeting and express a point. So that's, that's a great question. Um, anybody other? We have a few time for a few more. Yes? Earlier you brought up that you're basically the end of retention of your information. Yes. Obviously, the easiest way to prevent that is not to those things that might get you in trouble. Right. But I'm not an expert at that, but from what I've heard, um, no. So the, <laughs> so the key thing is, is from today going forward, if there's the only thing that you've learned here tonight is not to post stuff of 
you know, putting a beer, you know. There's one kid that I was on Twitter here that I, that I checked, great at opening bottles with his mouth. You know, with the, you know, somebody that followed me on Twitter today, I don't know if you're here, but he was opening the, uh, and I, by the way, I, everybody that follows me on Twitter and everybody that follows me on LinkedIn and everything that I do, I always look at their profile. I never just click accept. Because again, you learn. You never know who it's gonna be. So that's a good question. I, I think the best thing to do is, like tomorrow my diet starts again. Well, your diet on Facebook starts tomorrow. You know, just all of you, just cool it. Yes? It's kind of comical, but did you have any topics on the pizza, or was it just like life? I had everything. No, you know what the pizza, it was the, it was the pizza, you gotta remember. You know, Domino's was big when I was in college, so it was 30 minutes of free, and so we would always send it to the dorm across the street, you know, and then we'd go, oh, where are you? So we got a lot of free pizza, so it just, <laughs> you know, and then there was the old time that I'm a big, I'm a big Star Trek fan, so back then they got a Betamax or a VCR and they got Star Trek, Wrath of Khan that I could see without the, without the sound on, by, by the way, and I'm sitting and my roommates looked at me, they couldn't believe me the next morning, I said, what? They go, you were sleeping on the couch with your hand in the sour cream and onion potato chips, eating the potato chips in your sleep. So I'm telling you, it's, it's a disease. It's, you know, <laughs> you know, I say I'm not gonna do it. I'll go to a restaurant, I'll have the salad. Yeah, give me the steak. There was one time I was away um, with my wife, and she goes to the bathroom, I go to, this, I go to the waitress, I go, come here. Whatever you say, just tell her that they're out of salads and that you had to bring me the steak. Okay, so she comes in and I, I said, I'll have the salad or whatever, and my wife goes, okay, I'll have the fish. And she comes in, she brings this big juicy steak, and my wife's like, what's that all about? I'm like, she goes, she, they're out of salads, and my wife just looked at me. I always kid around that I would be better off being caught taking a blonde down to this convention than I would be if I went out and had an ice cream sundae with you guys afterwards, okay? <laughs> And so, because, you know, my wife, who I've, you know, it's actually my second wife, so, you know, but I've known her since I was three, and she still looks like she's 18, so, you know, she walks around with me like, okay, come on, you know, but uh, I am working on it, did Bikram Yoga twice, but we have one minute, one more question, anybody? Yes. I just have a quick one. What is the, uh, what would you recommend the best way to learn, like, the market you want to do as, like, a beginning trader, like, trading books? Okay, the beginning traders, the best way to do it is go to greenbergcapital.com and I will send you my, and I will send you my free trading tips. I have one, I, I actually just wrote a bunch of trading tips that I give out, okay? But besides that, you know, it's interesting, my son is in um, an internship this year with one of the biggest traders, you know, at the exchange. And they have him reading five newspapers a day. And I will, if you send me an email, just remind me that I'm the guy, I will send you the list of books that, you know, anybody, you know, I'll do this the list of books that this guy had my son read. And, but the most thing with trading is that it's very hard to learn about trading without actually trading. And then one of my blogs talks about that, about how to start a trading, you know, trading while you're in college, and also not to paper trade, that you're better off putting a small amount of money into an account, because there's nothing like losing money to make you feel like you've had a really bad day. And when you say you bought a stock and it went down and all of a sudden it went up, you don't feel the pain, because trading is really about pain and pleasure. It's a simple fact. It feels good when you make money. It feels like crap when you lose money. But in, in paper trading, if you don't actually feel it, you'll never learn. So, you know, you got E-Trade, you got all these other things, but only put in, and this is what I say in my blog, you only put in what you are ready to blow. Because if you think you're gonna put $1,000 in there and make it 100000 it's not gonna happen. But if you put in $1,000 and you go through that $1,000 and you're actually learning something, you know, when we, have, when we put traders in the ring, we would look at them and they would come up, oh, I lost this, I said, how much would it cost you to go to grad school? It will cost you money to learn how to trade. So, but make it nice and small and realistic. I thank you very much. Seriously, you know, I... <laughs> on all those pikes I was supposed to, you see? I screwed up. Let's just now, since my secretary put all this work into it, ready? Bikes! Right? Bikes! 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 I like that one. Okay. And then my fourth shameless plug. Okay. So, feel free. Contact me, whatever you need. I'll be doing a lecture, what time tomorrow? I don't know. 11.15 uh, or something? 11.15. Yes. Everybody go on the tour of National. It's very rare that you get to see it, because it's been 30 years and I still haven't seen it. 
Um, but come back here, we'll be doing a money in motion and just really talking about just, you know, where a lot of people throw up statistics and blah, blah, blah. I'm not doing that. We're just going to talk about, you know, what you need to do to, to be financially okay and to be comfortable. So thank you, everybody.